and now. So we like to make a trip to the other store. Um, it looks like quite a few people would say yes to that. 75%, 25%. Anyone any thoughts about this? Why did you chose yes? Just says no. So first question, did you uh, get randomized or no? Well, we'll talk about that in a okay. second. <laughs> um, anyone want to say something about why you chose yes? Did it seem like a good idea or a good deal? Actually, the reason I chose yes is because I read an article this morning yeah. that was talking about ways to save money, and it was saying that when we, when we have a choice like that, yeah. we usually don't make the trip. Huh. But if we do, then we can actually save more money in the long run, and I was thinking about that. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah? Well, I think it depends on the marginal cost of extra time. Like if you earn yeah. 2000 bucks an hour, then yeah. you're probably not going to make it. But since the, the three, but since we're a kind of students, a lot of student debt, ten bucks, well, for fifteen minutes, it's okay. Right? All right, I'm just saying that. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was doing the same thing. But what I've always said, told, been told as a general rule of thumb is take your hourly rate, and then uh, one third of that should be the rate for your leisure time. Okay. And I was like, eh, that's less than my you know, rate for my leisure time. So. Okay, interesting. I've heard of the rule actually. Let me see if I, I work by that. <laughs> we looked at it about percentages. Um, it's six to six percent off. In other place, you still had um, probably smart idea. But. I do that as well, actually, like all the calculations, yeah. and I forget how much I am per hour and things like that. But realistically, at the end of the day, if I'm already in one place, yeah. I'm not going to go somewhere else. Huh, like, I just, I so the math didn't work out. No, I mean I did the math. Yeah. But like, it wasn't worth it. It's not worth it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I I did the math. It's a saving of ten dollars. It's a hourly saving at the rate of forty dollars mm -hmm. to me it would depend on a lot of factors. Do yeah. I have an important call or meeting coming up or do I have free time? Yeah. Is it pouring rain or snow or is it really nice weather? Right. I thought if it's like today, nice weather, would my taking a walk if you don't have anything to do immediately, yeah. I might do it. Otherwise I wouldn't. If I voted yes, but in the absence of a lot of relevant factors. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that's exactly right. A lot of the things that have come up <coughs> so far have to do with context dependence, right? Like the way maybe I feel about this, or if it's worth my time, do I want to take a stroll through nice sunshine? Um, but one of the things that you had a question about was where you randomized, and I guess uh, you gave something away there, which is, yes, there were two versions, actually. And some of the people might have thought, sure, I'm going to take a walk. This seems like maybe 66% you know, of the price produced seems like a pretty good deal. And maybe some of you were thinking, that's kind of odd. Um, especially with the 66%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll show you something else, which is another poll. It's still favoring yes, which to be fair, I'm a little bit surprised about. Um, for other times I've, I've done this in, in most classes, it turns out that no is quite a bit stronger. But you can really see there's something else going on, which is more people seem to think it's not worth the trip than you know before. Before it was only 25%, now we're close to 40. Um, and I guess, if someone wants to say something that to why they chose no, it might be interesting to hear that as well. Um, yes. So I don't know if everyone said this, but mine said that I was also buying a jacket for fifteen mm dollars, -hmm. mm -hmm. and so I think I was I immediately started comparing fifteen to one twenty-five, and fifteen seemed like not a big deal, mm -hmm. and then I was only saving ten dollars, so then it just seemed like it just was marginal. Right. Right. Interesting. Uh, so with my favorite part now. A couple of you guys are sitting around thinking there's definitely something worth going on because it's definitely not $125 that this was costing. So let's look at this. Um, specifically, we had two versions, and one of them read this, which is you're buying a jacket for $125 and a calculator for $15. Then you're informed by this calculator guy that the calculator is on sale nearby for just $5. Um, maybe it's a good idea to go for a stroll, maybe for a walk. It's only 50 minutes away, and it saves you 10 bucks, right? But you just mentioned something slightly different, and the other half of you will think, well, I'm not so sure if that was such a good deal, because at the end of the day, Jackie was 15 bucks, and the calculator for 125 was only reduced by $10. So for some people, and in fact, actually, perhaps if you aren't like, exposed to behavioral science and behavioral econ, most people, <laughs> they think this is not worth their time. All of a sudden, all of the savings is $10 in both of them. A lot of people do this kind of intuitive math in their heads, right? They're like, what a steal, you know, like 66% off. This is like 
almost free, and it's only 15 minutes away. I'm going to do that. 10 bucks safe, right? Most of the money is basically safe because it's only five bucks now. Whereas if you turn the numbers around so that you calculate the costs more now, the ten dollars just seem so much less worth, even though it's the same amount of savings. Yeah. Um, a comment on that. So I think that's true for um, in developed countries, yeah. but. We ran a similar experiment yeah. on, in developing countries, and turns out people actually think the marginal utility of money is the yeah. same, regardless of where you are. But in developed countries, for us, we're like richer people, right? After yeah. a certain level, yeah. um, for you, it doesn't seem because we do percentage calculations. But if you're thinking from like a poverty perspective, ten dollars is ten dollars. Yeah. So it only holds true in a setting like this. Mm -hmm. Um, but not like if you do with rich people in developing countries, yeah. um, it doesn't actually help. Really. That's fascinating. Are you working with um, Anush Shah on this point? Uh, no, I was actually working um, with the World Bank um, ah, yeah, cool. on the project. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. So that's a great, this is actually just, uh, I saw something very similar presented earlier this year at the Economic um, Association Conference. And um, Anush Shah, who's a professor at U Chicago, has exactly that point. He's in fact making the point that when you have maybe a bit more wealth, all of a sudden some other biases can creep in, like this one perhaps, whereas when you're, you know, poor people often seen as like making sometimes very uh, irrational choices, but he brings up one of those examples and says, no, you know what, in some cases they can actually make really rational decisions because you know what, $10 really matters for them, and so they're not going to fall for this trick, whereas maybe wealth can sometimes do that. So there's some interesting and important um, boundary conditions to this which we're probably not going to touch on all of them, but you should certainly think about that, because every decision that um, we make, obviously, <laughs> we do in a certain context. We can try to control some of it with our experiments and then the architecture around it, but there will be other factors you might not know about. So this is super interesting. I'm glad you brought that up, yeah. So if anyone um, thinks this is kind of strange, let's see what the, the second um, experiment tells us. You never know if this is going to work actually in class, so I'm always excited to see if you guys... Um, we ran something like four years ago, and it worked perfectly. I don't remember what the example was. And then um, the Washington Post or someone covered it, and then two years later we ran it again. Everyone just got it. They're like, well, obviously, you know, it's such an obvious example. Um, and so obviously you can learn how these things are coming into our popular culture. I'm very curious about this one, because I did run this last time two years ago, um, and I've been told it's more popular now. So yeah. I, I was just curious, have you... Yeah. Have you done uh, examples where you ask both versions A and B in succession, maybe in a random order, to the same group? Yeah, yeah, fascinating. That's a good point. Um, I haven't, but there's research that's um, called Joint versus Separate Evaluation, right. um, actually by Max Spaceman and um, collaborators. And um, what they find is very often our comparison, as soon as we have two things in front of us, our comparison mindset becomes a lot more rational because we start focusing on things that may matter a bit more. And just to give you some very important context in hiring, um, if you think about very typical stereotype categorization, um, if you're hiring for a position that's like computer science, you know, engineering kind of thing, and you have men and women, you know, bring in their uh, scores on how well they program, turns out people are unsurprisingly pretty uh, prejudiced against women because for some reason engineers must be male, and so they think, well, if I look at the CV or the score, they're doing better, but this goes completely away if you put them right next to each other, even with um, information about their gender, and you say, put it better. Instead of having them just look at one of them, and then they start bringing in all the, you know, discriminate, this implicit bias that like discriminates perhaps against women who might be just as good or better in programming, and just looking at one applicant at a time can make you much more biased. And if you look at both of them, you're like, well, clearly, either the woman or the man was better or not. And so then you can make a decision that the bias goes away mostly. Turns out, though, what I found interesting is it works both ways. So for more creative jobs, people have this association, uh, association that women are better at it. And again, like it goes away when you put them next to each other. So I think there's a fascinating idea to just get people into the habit of not making decisions necessarily in isolation. Yeah. Um, how much? Like I feel like I feel when we just fill out some questions yeah. that could be completely different than what we actually do. Mm. Yeah. So like how, how can we, how much can we believe mm -hmm. a questionnaire? Like if we role play, I think it increases the chance to be yeah. clear. No, it's fascinating. So there are different opinions on <coughs> this. I'm going to give you my okay. take on it. Okay. There's, uh, in terms of research fields, there's that difference. <coughs> um, economists are very, very strong on this idea of incentive compatible behavior, which means 
just asking someone on a, on a survey, like, would you do such a thing? Like, question two here. Yeah? <laughs> would you give money to a complete stranger? They think that's not actually very insightful because you're not actually giving your own money away. If it were your own money, that really means, you know, you believe in this kind of thing. Um, psychologists tend to be across the board there. Some people think, yes, it needs to be incentive compatible, and some think, you know what, hypothetical questions are good enough. So I think there's differences in opinions. I am also more on the idea that we can try to make this incentive compatible. And so question two was part of one of many experiments that I did for my, uh, for my PhD. And I can tell you that it usually, like, people are a little bit gener more generous when you ask some hypothetical questions, but the general idea that people give when, you know, you give them a pot of money, they could keep everything for themselves, and many people give money away. So there seems to be, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, my question is really, sorry, I'm not, I'm yeah, sure. meant to express it, but yeah. if, if it's just a questionnaire, yeah. I don't know if people are going to actually do what, say what they actually would do in that case. Okay. Like so if you had us all, and it was like a case like that, with yeah. the calculator and the jacket or whatever, right. or the next thing, and we were actually there, and like, it was like an actual, not even yeah. literal, like it was actually an environment that it was, like I think you could right. get like completely opposite results. Yeah, and but this is like my... That, that's a fair concern, actually, one reason why these field experiments and um, much of the research is now trying to also tackle the same questions we have done in the lab, now in the field as well. So although we, we think we know, what is happening by lab, with doing lab experiments, some people are skeptical and they say, you will never do that in the real world. And so a lot of the um, experiments I'm going to talk about are with organizations in the field to get around their concerns. These are actual decisions in natural environments. <coughs> yeah. All right, um, let's quickly go to question two, just so we have done that as well. Um, This was the first group. All right, let's see. Most people give five dollars. Um, 16, 17 percent give nothing. We have, um, I think this is one or two outliers out here who give eight dollars, very generous. Um, wherever you are, that's very nice of you. And um, a couple of people down here. All right, this is the first group. So again, you were randomized. Um, one version of the text and then another version of the text. And let's quickly look at the other one. And this one looks more, you know, a bit more dispersed, I would say. So there's still quite a lot of people at zero, few people at five, a bit more at three. Now we are clearly more going on there. So seven and ten. Someone was really nice. So someone gave ten, uh, all their ten dollars away. So that's very nice. Um, what we did here is the following. So if you were in the first um, group, the group that primarily was around the five dollars and there was one person who was at eight, you saw this. You're going to play the Wall Street game and imagine you have ten dollars and you split it with someone you don't know. And if you were in group B, the ones who were a bit more dispersed, you saw this. You're playing the community game. And so obviously this makes no sense, you're playing exactly the same game, except for we call it different things. In one case we call it something that we think maybe primes you to think a bit more competitively, the Wall Street game. And the other one, we're going to somehow prime you with this idea that it's a community. We're all nice, we're all good people, and whoever it was who gave $10 really seemed to think that this is about being a partner in a good community. So in many ways, <coughs> we are way too small a sample to make any conclusive evidence from this, but it's interesting to see how these framing effects can also be very important in our decisions. And often we're not aware of what these things are called, right? Um, any any thoughts about this before we move on? Do you believe it, by the way, or have you seen this before? So I have a few. And which one is closer to the? Um, I don't remember which version. Of that's the because there's a couple of versions of this experiment, but right. like compared to the original name, is that I think um, the Wall Street's closer to the original. Good question. It's, um, oh, this is actually the dictator game, the dictator, very yeah, yeah, exactly. the ultimatum game. So um, Dave Rand and a couple of others have done experiments on that. What's the neutral frame, right? That's actually one of the questions you'll hear all the time. Like, we don't want to nudge, we don't want to do experiments because we don't want to influence people. But it's fair to ask, in, in absence of these names, what do people think of? And luckily for us, it's closer to the community game. So it turns out people seem to spontaneously think a bit more of um, 
know, being nicer maybe to other people when confronted with this, and this game activates this competitive thinking. There are again boundary conditions, and Dave is actually one of the experts on that. Uh, yeah. What's the end? What's the minimum number hmm. you would have to have in order to sort of see this? Yeah, good well. question. I'll table that for now because it's, we're going to spend quite a bit of time thinking about that. It's a great question, oh, okay. right. and one is often overlooked, so I'm glad you asked that. Yeah. And we're not going to come to sample size today, it'll be in one of the next okay. lectures. Yeah. Um, so I actually was trying to guess what this was, and I thought it was of people who saved the $10, they would yeah. value their money more. Um, uh -huh. Like, if, for instance, if they walk, they would then keep more than $10. Um, uh, okay. Have you looked at that, or like, so was that, that again? Like was that intentional, or what like, was intentional? Because before we yeah. saved ten dollars, ah, okay, and then now we're splitting the same amount. Ah, uh, no, that was me um, thinking of two games that I like oh, okay. a lot, and so I decided to pick them. It's a good point. Maybe I should get rid of the <laughs> yeah. fact that they're both ten dollars. No, I didn't think about that. Yeah. <laughs> that too. That's right. There's an anchor for that as well. <laughs> the ten dollars you were saving beforehand, you're now spending on it on someone, um, someone else. All right, cool. So let's talk about, so these are just a few examples, and I wanted to bring it up because it's good to understand, like you feel what it's like to make some of these decisions, um, some of where this research comes from, and some of where these biases that we're going to talk about quite a bit um, when we talk about experiments, um, you know, what they feel like and how they can be influenced by the context. Because we are going to think about experiments that change the context and the environment, right? So the kind of um, economics that we're talking about, some people refer to as it's irrational, um, some people will just call it behavioral economics. Um, I'm not going to take a stance on what I think about these names, but I can tell you um, a bit more the, the concept and the theories that people have to think about decision making and just overview kind of type. So here's what the traditional economic theory says about decision making. <coughs> Assume you're in a world with full information. Now that's a big assumption, right? Like often in the real world we don't have that. But let's just assume for now we have really good um, information about certain decisions you're going to make. Um, you can figure out the costs and benefits of the decision you're going to make, and that means the incentives are pretty clear. Straightforward, right? Like you know how much if you do a certain action you're going to benefit or how much it's going to cost you. And that means you're going to change your behavior so that you're going to maximize your benefit and reduce your, um, your costs. So that's a very classic model of um, what they call rational decision making. And it works often, I should say that as well. Like some things really seem to work quite well. Think of how um, traffic lights, for instance, have changed the way people behave. It's a pretty good signal when it's red that there's pretty high costs for going through a red light. And so most people think this through and they're like, right, you stop at red. Now there could also be other reason why you stop at red, that you've been taught that way in the social norm. But a lot of people will realize good incentives to stop red. But there are other examples where this really breaks down. How many people, for instance, have you heard say, you know what, I smoke because I didn't know until really recently it was bad for me. Like, how many people say they really just smoke because, man, I had no idea smoking was bad for me. <laughs> Not that many people, right? A lot of people actually, in fact, a lot of smokers know a lot about um, the health costs and, the, um, and very few benefits, I assume, of smoking. In fact, a lot of people who do smoke say, I don't want to quit. They really don't want to smoke anymore, and yet, sadly, very few actually do. Very few. So that's the question. Like, if it's true that we have this type of decision making, if I know the health costs associated with smoking, and the incentives are clear, and I really want to stop, then I just should change my behavior accordingly. And yet, so many people can't do it with, especially health problems, but a lot of other things as well, right? And that's where this whole new idea of economics comes in, um, and this, these biases and heuristics that you keep hearing about. There are plenty of them, and. Um, some of them we just talked about as well. So there's framing, like the community game, the Wall Street game. Uh, we talked about, where is it? No solution, didn't have a joint and separate evaluation. Anyway, there's a few of these, and they're all very important um, to understand when people deviate from their decision making from what's rationally, what we would predict. A lot of these biases are at work, right? And in many ways, these biases and these heuristics that we're using to make decisions are pretty good, actually. Right? Like I said before, it's pretty good that we understand um, when we get to a red light, probably means to stop. If we had to work it out every single time we're there, that's going to be cognitively really effortful. And so our fast thinking system kicks in, and in that moment, you know, we, we are relying on a heuristic or a bias sometimes that, um, that we have so that we can make a decision much more quickly. 
However, as I said, there are systematic de deviations. And some people, lots of people actually, in the 70s, 80s, tried to fix those errors, right? Think about why do we have those? It seems really stupid, so to speak, that we make um, uh, consistently the same kind of mistakes. Why do we do that? Let's fix it. It was very difficult. I don't think there's like a solution to fixing these permanently. And so instead, people have started to ask, how can we help people, given those biases and heuristics, how can we help them make better decisions for themselves? So now we're talking no longer about fixing what we think is pretty um, innate in, in most of us, or like learned at least. Um, and then we're talking about designing something around so that the biases don't have to go away, but we're taking advantage for the better. And um, with that, I think a whole new era started when this concept really took hold of, um, in, of the population. So behavioral science really has gone mainstream in the last few years. And to really appreciate it, we should start with, um, I guess, what the early days of uh, behavioral economics were. And a guy who I think often gets overlooked is um, Herbert Simon. I mean, he doesn't, he's actually a Nobel laureate. He has a lot of credit for <laughs> awesome things, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but he actually came up with boundary rationality. Great concept, which basically says a lot of the things we've just talked about. And particularly, he talked about the fact that um, given information is sometimes very difficult to obtain all of the information necessary it's also difficult to have all of the information to make to always go through this cognitive effort. Sometimes our brains just can't make the best um, decision, even with all information is available. We do our best, we have this bounded rationality. And this was really crucial in the development of what later um, pop, uh, very popularly became known as behavioral economics. And these two guys, Kahneman and Tversky, um, wrote several papers really documenting these deviations that we just talked about, these heuristics, these biases. And um, actually, Kahneman is also a Nobel laureate, no, and obviously Traversky would be too if he had lived long enough to, to get it, but unfortunately not. Um, so these are really important people who we have to thank for a lot to understand decision-making in this new concept. I would definitely recommend, if you ever want to read a bit of the re uh, research behind this, um, this is a famous paper in Econometrica about loss aversion, prospect theory, and this is like a science paper summarizing most of the heuristics that we mentioned before. 